morning and welcome to Christ United Reformed Church. It's good to be gathered together as the people of God to be able to worship his name together. I just want to draw your attention to one announcement that's in the bulletin about our Reformation Day celebration that's on page four. Um, There's details there about that event, but that's happening Sunday, October 27th. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Please read uh, that announcement about the Reformation Day celebration that will happen after our Sunday school time on the 27th. So we're looking forward to that very much. Our God has called us to his worship this morning. and He does so with these words from Isaiah chapter 44, verses 21 to 23. Remember these things, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, O forest, and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. Let us stand together that we might hear the blessing of our God. Dearly loved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And he greets us this morning with these words from Romans 1. To all those who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's take up our Psalters together and turn to number 24b, a setting of Psalm 24, the earth and its riches. And we'll sing all the verses together of number 24b. seated.
We now want to turn our attention to the reading of God's law. The scriptures teach that through the law comes the knowledge of sin, Romans 3.20. And the Apostle Paul testifies, I would not have come to know sin except through the law, Romans 7.7. Thus the law shows us our sin and consequently our need of Christ. So let us read the law of God as we find it in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. And Jesus summarized this law in Matthew chapter 22 when he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Uh, One of the things we read the law of God to remind us where we stand before him. Uh, One of the things that the Lord says about sin in Isaiah chapter 43 verse 24 He says to the people, but you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. Um, Our sin impacts God, not just the people we sin against in the world, but it's an offense against God. It's an offense that burdens him. It's an offense that wearies him. Um, And that's part of what sin ought to do when it convicts us. Convict us, not only have we sinned, but we've sinned against this God uh, who has been kind enough to redeem a people, who has been kind enough to be a good God to this world. That's what the heaviness of our sin should bring to us. And that's why when we meditate on our sins, it should drive us to confess our sins and seek forgiveness in the only place we can find it, in the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's why we always follow the reading of God's law with a prayer of confession. We have a prayer of confession printed in our bulletin. We'll pray this prayer out loud together, and then we'll leave time at the end for each one of us to confess silently his or her own personal sins. So let's pray this prayer together, not just from our lips, but from the heart. Let us pray. Most merciful Heavenly Father, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have sinned by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. May your Spirit help us to delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Father in heaven, hear our prayers, not on account of our righteousness, but on account of your great mercy. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, dearly loved people of God, you've heard God's law and have confessed your sins to our merciful heavenly Father. The Holy Spirit assures us with these words also from the book of Isaiah, where God says, in love, you have delivered my life from the pit of destruction, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. And I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sin. Uh, the Lord is a God who is burdened with our sins, but there's nothing we can do to unburden him. There's nothing that we can do to make this right. And so it's wonderful that God says, I will make it right. I will blot out your sins. I will not remember them anymore. I will cast them behind my back. And he does that through the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, so therefore, we always remind ourselves that if we pe- repent of our sins and believe in gospel, God's gospel promise, that he grants us forgiveness of sins and eternal life by grace because of Christ's one sacrifice, once for all accomplished on the cross. For all who believe in that, then in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ and by the authority of his word, I assure you that your sins are forgiven you and you are not under the condemnation of God. Uh, How we need to hear that word of grace from God's throne to know that he alone can save us from our sins and that he's done it by his son. And then what can we do but return praise to the God who's done it? And let's do so singing the doxology. We now want to confess what it is that we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed, a faithful creed of the Christian church. If you don't know this by heart, it's printed there on page five of the bulletin. So Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's now go before our God in a time of congregational prayer together. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, you are our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. You have given us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification in our Lord Jesus Christ. You have supplied all our needs according to your riches and glory in him. And we acknowledge that we can do all things through your strength. You have reassured us again this Lord's Day that you are compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. We're reminded that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And your kindness and love for mankind have appeared in him. You promise to forgive those who do not suppress or hide their sins. And we have acknowledged them and confessed them to you. And so we know that you will have mercy upon us in his name, that you have hidden your face from our sins, that you have blotted out our iniquities, you have covered them and will not count our iniquity against us. You have forgiven the guilt of our transgressions, you have purified us that we might be clean, you have washed us that we might be whiter than snow, all through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so Father, we thank you that in Christ Jesus we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We give thanks that in Christ we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. 
We give thanks for our church and its leadership, for our families and for our nation. Bless us all and help us to magnify your name. We are grateful for your abundant provision, both spiritual and material. You are the source of every good and perfect gift. And so we praise you, O Father of lights, in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. You have commanded us to pray on behalf of all people, and so we lift these requests before you. We pray for all of our civil magistrates. We know that even the heart of the king is in your hand, and you channel it like a stream of water in whatever direction you wish. We pray that you would have mercy upon us and give us leaders who have a regard for you, who will regard your name as holy, and who will understand that in whatever office they hold, they are to be your servants, for you have ordained them. We ask that you would bring new life to your church and that we may begin our repentance at our own house, in our own churches, even as we plead with you to have mercy upon us as a nation, as a people, and as a culture. We pray that the light of Christ would be rekindled with great glory and intense brightness in our country, and that there would be a revival of the knowledge of you, without which our land will mourn and our people will perish. To that end, we pray for the mission of the church and the salvation of all humanity, we know that the fields of our labor are white for harvest. Pour out your spirit, even as you've done in former days. Anoint your preachers and open to us a door for the word. We know that the gospel is your power for, for salvation, so we pray that you would send a mighty revival. That you would draw to yourself a multitude that no one can number from every nation and tribe and people and tongue. We ask that you would be with our dear brothers, Reverend Ferrari in Italy and Reverend Corcha in Romania. That you would bless their work. Watch over and continue to keep our pastor, Reverend Cortez, as he labors aboard the USS Sterrett. We're so thankful to hear that he's and see that he's back with us, and we rejoice that you have heard our prayers on his behalf and on behalf of his shipmates. We thank you that you have brought him safely home to us and to his family. We pray that you would give them a blessed time of fellowship together. We pray, Father, that you would be with all of our service members, especially those who are in deployment in dangerous areas you would be with their families and keep them all in your care. Father, we pray also for the sanctification of the saints. You would help us not to love the world or the things of the world. You would not let us be seduced by the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the boastful pride of life. That you would help us to seek first your kingdom and its righteousness. And that we would make it our ambition to be pleasing to you. And finally, O oh Lord, we pray for those afflicted souls. We think particularly of all the damage that's been done by hurricanes and all the people that are affected by that, we pray that you would watch over and keep them. You would bring them relief speedily. We ask particularly that you would continue to watch over and bless our shut-ins, Judith Rayner and Ann Van Stell. It's been a long time since these dear sisters have been with us, but Lord, we know that they are still part of us, and we thank you for them and pray your blessing upon them. Uh, continue to bring Bill Storms to full healing. Be with Dave Butts and his ongoing struggles. We're thankful that he can be here with us this morning with Jackie. We pray for all of these dear saints and their families and their caregivers. Watch over them, give them strength. And we pray, O oh great physician, that you might heal all who suffer, whether in mind or in body or in spirit. You would be their rock and their fortress, their shield and their stronghold, their deliverer and their refuge. Send to them your comforter. Use their afflictions for their good. And build them up in their faith and in their love and in their hope. Draw them closer to yourself. Cause their suffering and all things to work together for their good, even as you so promised all who are called according to your purpose. Keep all of our children and our young people safe and steadfast in Christ. We pray all of these things in his name, closing with that prayer he taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. <coughs> in the power and the glory forever. Amen. We now have the opportunity to worship God with our gifts and offerings. The offering this morning is for the general fund.
Let's take up our Psalters once again, and as a song of preparation, turn to number 119T. 119T, see my distress and... As we prepare to open God's word, let's ask him to bless it to us. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who has called the Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, grant that we may hear and read and learn and inwardly digest them, that through the comfort of your holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. And please turn with me in God's word to Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7. You'll find that on page 1200 of many of our pew Bibles, Romans chapter 7. And if you'd also turn with me in the back of your Psalter hymnals to page 872, page 872, we want to consider Romans 7 together with Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 2 which is comprised of questions 3, 4, and 5. Again, that's on page 872 and 873 in the back of the Psalter hymnal. So I want to first read God's word and think about what it has to say to us and then read uh, Lord's Day 2 for you, and then we can uh, think about these things in connection with one another. Um, If you're visiting with us this morning, we've started a series through the Heidelberg Catechism, and we've gotten to Lord's Day 2, so you're getting in on the beginning end of the series, um, and so we want to read from God's Word. So we're going to read from Romans chapter 7, beginning at verse 7, and read through the end of the chapter, and then we'll read from Lord's Day 2. But let's pay careful attention to what we read in Romans 7, for this is God's own Word. What then shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me all kinds of covetousness. 
For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For, what I, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not, for I do, not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want... It is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Thus far the reading of God's word, may he bless it to us. And we want to think about that text in connection with Heidelberg Catechism Lord's Day 2, which asks three questions, questions 3, 4, and 5. Question 3 asks, how do you come to know your misery? And the answer is the law of God tells me. Question four asks, what does God's law require of us? Christ teaches us this in summary in Matthew 22, 37 to 40. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Question five asks, can you live up to all this perfectly? The answer is no. I am inclined by nature to hate God and my neighbor. And so we want to think about this uh, passage and this catechism section uh, to think about our misery. Um, we said last week that question two of the Heidelberg Catechism um, asked the, the important question, what do you need to know to live and die in the joy of the comfort that Christ's gospel offers us? Uh, what three things do you need to know? And the first thing it said we need to know is how great our sin and misery are. Um, that's an important part of being prepared for the truth of the gospel, to know how great your sin and misery are. And so it's probably not surprising then that the catechism would follow up by saying, how do you come to know your sin and misery? If it's important that you know it, um, the catechism, it's not surprising, would go on to say, how do we know it? Um, how will we learn how great our sin and misery are? And the point of Lord's Day 2 is really to say we come to know how great our sin and misery are through God's law, first and foremost. It's through God's law that we come to know our sin and misery. And so we want to consider uh, what Paul has to say about the law and its work in Romans chapter 7 in connection with these things. Because Paul, in talking about the law, talks in this passage about the reality of the law, uh, what the law provides. He talks about the revelation of the law what the law reveals to us about ourselves and also the resistance to the law that still remains even in those who've been converted to Christ. And that's how we want to think about this passage together. The reality of the law, the revelation of the law, and the resistance to the law with which we still struggle in this life. So Paul begins with, or we're going to begin with, the reality of the law. Uh, Paul talks in Romans 7 repeatedly about the law of God. Um, and so we really need to begin with the question, what does God's law provide? When Paul's talking about the law, what is he talking about here? 
And after we understand what the law is, then we can begin to explore what Paul has to say about it. So the first reality of the law that we come to is its call. Uh, what does the law of God call us to? What does it demand of us? Um, and this really is answered in question four of the catechism. What does God's law require of us? Christ teaches us this in summary in Matthew 22. Hopefully those words sounded familiar. We read that summary of the law from our Lord every Sunday after we read the Ten Commandments. And so we should be familiar with that requirement. Uh, God's law can be summarized as a law of love. Right? We are to love the Lord our God with all our hearts and souls and minds and strength. And we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And in this, we see in the law an expression of God's goodness. We see something of who God is, that this is his command for the world. Um, it's a good command. It's a good will for God in the world. I don't think anyone would really dispute that. If you say, what does God require? And you say, God requires us to be loving. I think most people would see that as a good command. To love God and to love neighbors as we love ourselves. It's a good will that's expressed by our God in his world. That his world that he made would be filled with love. Love for him and love for one another. It's a good will from our good God. And it's for a good purpose. Uh, why does God command these things? Why does he want these things of us? Because his good purpose is that we would live. Right? Paul in verse 10 calls it the commandment that brought life. That's what the commandment is intended to do, to bring life. Right? God's purpose was that we would love and live with him. That that love would produce a life, a life uninterrupted. A life of fellowship with him and with our neighbors. It's, it's a good will. It's for a good purpose. Um, I think when Paul refers to the commandment that brought life, he clearly has in mind what Leviticus 18.5 says. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. That the purpose of the law was good, to bring life. Uh, that's why God established it. He gives the law so that we might live. And so the first reality of the law that we, we come to is it's a commandment of life. It's a commandment that we love and live. But Paul doesn't just talk about the calling of the law. He also talks about its qualities in this passage. We need to understand the reality of what the law calls us to, but we also want to understand the reality of the qualities of the law as Paul talks about them. He says that particularly in verse 12. Where he says, so the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. That's the quality of the law. Um, and we might ask the question, what does Paul mean by contrasting uh, the law and the commandment, or distinguishing the law and the commandment? Well, I think what he's trying to do is hold up the whole law as being holy. And he says the whole law is holy. Everything that God has commanded is holy. It, he's holy. It comes from him. It's his word. It's holy because it's his. The whole thing of it, the whole part of the law is holy. And not only is the whole of the law holy, but each commandment that the law gives is also holy and good and righteous. So I think Paul is trying to emphasize here is that the law as a whole is holy, all of it together is good, and every individual commandment that the law makes is good and holy and righteous. He's trying to hold up the law and all of its qualities as being very good. It's good as a whole, it's good in each and every part, it's holy, it's righteous, it's good. There's nothing wrong with the law, it's perfect in every respect. Um, and that's, I think, uh, that's one of the reasons we're going to sing Psalm 119 following the service is because the part of Psalm, not, it's not, not 119, it also talks all about the law, but we're going to sing Psalm 19 after uh, the sermon because the end of Psalm 19 celebrates the perfections of the law. Uh, the law is good. There's nothing wrong with the law. That's what Paul is trying to make clear. He says that positively by saying the law is holy and good and righteous, and then he also raises two objections that people might bring to the law and says that they're not true. So positively, the law is holy and good and righteous. And then he comes with some questions. Is the law sin? In verse 7, he says, certainly not. And we'll consider the function of the law revealing sin in a moment. But Paul first wants to make the point, the law is not sin. 
there's nothing wrong with the law. The second negative he brings up in ver- is in verse 13. Did that good law bring death to me? If the law was intended to bring life and I find death in me, does that mean the law has brought death in me? He also says to that, certainly not. And again, we'll consider some of these things in the context of Paul's argument here, but he wants again to stress the point. There's nothing wrong with the law. The law is not sin. The law does not produce death. There's nothing wrong with the law of God. It wasn't the law that brought death instead of life. Death is not brought about by the law. Death is brought about by sin. And so why would Paul think he needed to answer those questions? Why would anybody be tempted to think that the law is sin or that the law brings death? Well, it's because of what the law reveals. And that's the revelation of the law that Paul gets into in his argument in this letter. Um, It's from Romans 7, in part, that question 3 of the Catechism comes. How do you come to know your misery? The law of God tells me. There are things that the law of God reveals. And so Paul talks about the revelation of the law of God. What does the law of God bring to light? Um, The first thing he says it brings to light is sin's existence. The law reveals the existence of sin. It makes sin known. As we've already said, the law tells us how it is that we are to live. It makes known to us, we could say, our duty before God. That we're called to be a loving people towards him and towards our neighbor. It makes us our duty known. But as we consider the law and as we consider its calling, as we consider its duty, we also come to recognize our deficit. That we have a duty of love, but the law tells us that we have a deficit of love. Now, boys and girls, deficit is a fancy word that just means not enough. Um, I use the fancy word because it starts with D, and I needed a second D, uh, deficit. But a deficit is what happens when you don't have enough. If your mom or dad gave you $5 at a store to buy something, and you found something that you really wanted, and you pull it down and said, I want this, and then you found out it cost $10, and you only have 5 you'd have a deficit, which is a fancy way of saying you wouldn't have enough. And what the law shows us is we have a deficit. We don't have enough. It says we ought to love God with all of our being and love our neighbor as ourselves. And then we look at our lives and we say, you know, I have a deficit of love. I don't love as I'm supposed to love. I don't love God as I'm supposed to love God. I don't love my neighbors as I'm supposed to love my neighbors. I have a deficit. And the law says that those who have a deficit are in danger. See why I needed a D? Uh, The law shows us our duty And then it shows us we have a deficit of our duty before God. And then it tells us if you have a deficit, you're in danger. You're in danger. Because the law says if you love God as he's called you, you will live as he's promised. But it also makes the danger known. Because if we don't love God the way we've been called to, we will not live as he's promised. And what Paul says is, That's what the law came and did for him. It exposed him as one who is in a deficit before God and in the danger of dying in his sin. That's the process that Paul is really describing in verses 7 through 13, how the law came to work in him, to make sin known. You might notice in verses 7 through 13, as Paul goes through his argument, in this portion, he's really talking in the past tense. There was a time when the law came and did this to him. Came and revealed his sin. Showed his sin for what it is. I think he's really describing in effect what happened when Saul the Pharisee became Paul the Christian. Same person, but became radically changed. And how did that change take place? Well, there was a time when Paul knew the law and knew it better than almost anyone else. Um, he, it was his desire to be a Pharisee of Pharisees, he said. He wanted to be the A number one top dog Pharisee. And if you did that, you really had to know the law, and you really had to try to live it. It's probable that Paul had at least all of the law memorized, the first five books of the Bible, but probably the whole Old Testament. He knew the word of God. 
And as a Pharisee, he went about trying to scrupulously obey everything that God had commanded him to do. And he thought he was doing a really good job of it. Right? Because Paul says when he was a Pharisee, he says in Philippians 3, I was blameless according to the law. I was killing it. There was no one who did a better job. I was seeking to be the best, not just in my learning, but in my living. Um, that's what I was seeking to do. But there was a day when the Holy Spirit opened Paul's eyes to see the law for what it was really calling him to do. And he understood the law of God in a way that he'd never understood it before. Where it suddenly came to him and revealed his sin in its true colors, as someone said. That's, I think, what Paul means when he says, you know, there was a time I was alive apart from the law. But when the law came, sin came alive and I died. Because I think he's saying, I was living the high life when I thought I was doing everything perfectly. I thought I was really pleasing God in all that I was doing. And all of a sudden, the law came and actually showed me what God was requiring and what really changed? The law made him know what sin is and saw the way sin operated in him. What changed in verse 7? He says, um, If it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, You shall not covet. The law began to speak to him by the illumination of the Spirit in a way it had not spoken before. And what happened when he started to see the existence of this sin that he hadn't known was there before? Right? He describes that in the second part of verse 8 through verse 10. Apart from the law, or, I'm sorry. Yeah, for apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. Right, because he had all this knowledge of the Old Testament, when the, sin, when the law came alive and actually showed him what his sin was, he thought that this, life that was, this law that was guaranteeing him life suddenly promised him death suddenly convicted him as a transgressor. And where he thought he could put his hope for life, he found that actually he was seeing only death. It convicted him as a transgressor. The law made Paul understand the existence of his sin and to understand that that sin is an active enemy. Right? It, it's not just sin, like we talked about last time, it's not just something we do, it's who we are, and there's a sin that dwells in us and that is an active enemy. So he doesn't just realize the existence of sin, he realizes the existence of sin as an active enemy, as an indwelling sin that is against him. It's operating in a way that he hadn't understood before. Um, so he recognizes its existence and its activity, what it does, um, and particularly what it does with the law. What the sin that lives within him does with the law. Because sin takes the law, but it twists it. It uses the law against us in order to trip us up. Paul personifies sin in these verses, doesn't he? As if sin is, a, is something doing something. It's active. And what does Paul realize by this illumination of the Spirit? That, the, that sin uses the law for evil. It takes what's good but uses it for an evil purpose. He says that in verse 8, doesn't he? Sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Um, maybe sometimes the arguments Paul is making can be a little difficult to understand in the abstract, and so maybe a concrete example would help. Think back to the Garden of Eden and the temptation of the devil. The devil personifies sin almost better than anyone else. Um, but when Paul says, you know, the, the sin used the law as an opportunity against me, um, isn't that what the devil did in the Garden of Eden? Where did he begin the assault on Adam and Eve? He didn't come with his own ideas. He didn't come with his own suggestions. 
Where did he start? He started with the commandment of God. Did God really say? What did he do? He took the law, which was good. What was the law that he had given Adam and Eve? Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for the day you eat of the tree you will surely die. That was a good commandment, to keep them away from something that would bring death. There was nothing wrong with the commandment. It was good, it was holy, it was righteous. But the devil took what was good and holy and righteous and used it against them. He used it, as one person said, as a bridgehead for sin, to launch an attack on them to bring all kinds of wrong desires to birth. Um, In our fallen nature now, we understand how sometimes drawing attention to a command prompts us to do things we otherwise wouldn't do. Have you ever walked by a park bench that has a wet paint sign on it? Um, What do you see a lot of, I'd love someday to just set up a camera on a bench and say wet paint and then just set up a camera and see how many people walk by and look and say wet paint. Have you done that before? Maybe a waiter has brought you a plate at a restaurant and they set it down before you and they say, be careful, the plate's very hot. Now maybe if you've been at a restaurant, you've never even thought about touching a plate that's been set down in front of you. You wouldn't even have brought it to mind, but he says, very hot, and so what do you do? Ow! <laughs> right? Sometimes just bringing attention to the command can do that. Can just bring your attention. I would have had no desire to touch the park bench had I not seen the wet paint sign on it. I would have no desire to touch the plate if the waiter hadn't said, be careful, it's very hot. Now, wet paint's trying to keep you from getting wet by the paint. The waiter telling you that is trying to keep you from getting burned. There's nothing wrong with saying that, but what does sin do? It takes that and seizes an opportunity to create all kinds of covetousness. Um, it takes what's good and uses it as an opportunity for evil. And Paul said, that's what I started to see sin doing in my life. The law said, do not covet, and then I started thinking about all the things I wanted. And sin brought attention to the commandment, used it for evil, used it for evil by deceiving me. Right? Paul says, that's how sin works with the commandment as well. Verse 11, sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me, and through it killed me. The Garden of Eden is helpful for that too, isn't it? Because the devil comes and says, did God really say you can't eat of that tree? That you'll die if you eat of it? You know what the truth is? You won't really die. You know why God said that to you? Because he knows if you eat of that tree, you'll be like him. And what he really doesn't want is people to be like him. That's why you should really think more about that tree and think what you can get by eating that tree. And then Eve started thinking about the tree and seeing that the food was good for food and pleasing to the eye. And she took some and she ate and gave it to her husband who was with her and he ate and they died. First spiritually, then physically. The sin seized an opportunity through the commandment and deceived them and through it killed them. That's what Paul says sin does to us all. It uses the law for deceit and through the law kills. Um, The sin, what it does is deceives us into thinking you can have the sin without the misery. You can have the sin without the consequences. So go ahead and do it. And then once we've done it, we recognize that we, the truth of what's happened, we stand condemned as sinners under the law. That's what God, that's what the devil did through God's law in the garden. That's what Paul says sin does through the commandment in his life. And that's why Paul says, this is what the law reveals to me. The Holy Spirit used it for conviction of my sin, that I might be driven to look for righteousness, not in myself, but in the Lord Jesus Christ, to drive me into his arms for salvation. But Paul says, what I came to understand is that sin also uses the law. He uses the law to take opportunities when the law says what's right and wrong to draw my attention to what's wrong, to produce in me desires that are against God's law, to deceive us into thinking that we can do these things in order that it might bring us death. That's why Paul said, the law isn't sin, but it shows me my sin. 
The law is good. It doesn't produce death. It's the sin in me that produces death by transgressing God's good law. And Paul's point here is that even after we are born again by the Spirit of God, we still struggle against the sin that dwells in our members. That's why Paul ends this text talking honestly about the resistance to the law that exists in us. And that's what he spends really verses 14 through the end talking about, the resistance to the law that he notices in his life. There was a time when the law brought him to a knowledge of sin. I think he's talking about that conversion experience in the past tense in verses 7 through 13. But then he moves to the present tense in verse 14 to talk about his current struggle against sin. And what he's describing here is not just his struggle, it's the the struggle of every Christian that every one of us experiences in verse 14. What does he say? For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. I am of the flesh sold under sin. Um, This is why some people have tried to argue Paul's not talking about a regenerate Christian here, Uh, But this is exactly the same way he talks to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 3. Um, I would talk to you as mature, but you're still in the flesh. You're infants in Christ. Uh, In this way of talking, Paul is not saying you're not regenerate. Um, Paul is saying about what is still at work in us. As one person put it, that there is something in humanity which objects to God and seeks to be independent of him. And Paul says it's the difference between who we truly are as new creatures in Christ And what remains of the old self in our members. Um, Really, verse 25 is his conclusion of the whole matter. When at the end of verse 25, he says, So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. This is really the conclusion that the previous verses are all arguing towards. Where he's explaining how the innermost part of who we are, our minds, he calls it, is for God. We've been remade after the image of God, but the remainder of us, our members, are still fleshly and motivated by sin. That's why the catechism says in question five, can you live up to all this? Can you live up to the law of God perfectly? And the answer is no, I am inclined by nature to hate God and my neighbor. This is the flesh of me. This is the old me that remains Um, And Paul is talking in verses 14 to 23 about the interaction between these two realities, the innermost me, who I am in in reality, and the members, the remainder of the old self that still lives in me, um, that still does what the old self wanted to do. Um, And so there's a kind of dual reality that Paul is talking about, the innermost me, the me who I truly am by the saving work of Christ, and the former me who still resides in my members. And so Paul wants to to pull that out for us to understand who we are by nature and what we do as a result. Um, We are of the flesh by nature, he says in verse 14, sold under sin. He says in verse 18, nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. That's who we are by nature. And what does that nature produce? Well, if it's nothing good, and nothing good dwells in us by nature, then we can produce nothing good by nature. We do what is evil. We are opposed to God. We do the things he hates. When he says love, we hate. Um, That's the evil that's at work in us. Uh, But God has worked salvation in his people through Jesus Christ. That's no longer all we are. Apart from the saving work of Christ, that was all we are. Um, But Paul says that's not all we are. That's only part of what we are. Actually, it's only the remnant of what we were that exists in our members, uh, there's also something new that's been made new. Our innermost selves, our minds that belong wholly to God. This is the self that Paul says hates evil in verse 15 and does not want to do it. This is the self that testifies that the law is good and that is in full agreement with it in verse 16. This is the self that desires to do what is good in verse 21. Um, It's the reality we sang about in Psalm 119t. That reality that we call out against the law. There's part of us that wants, against sin, that wants to do the law, that hates wrongdoing and hates transgression. It's the self that's been remade by the work of the Spirit. The good news the passage offers us is that is the true self. That's who you truly are. 
the enemy, the indwelling sin operating in your members is not really who you are in Christ anymore. That's the good news. The bad news is we still war against that former self that remains in our members. But the true and inmost self that belongs to Christ often succumbs to the remainder of the old self that's at work in our members. So much so that Paul can say, this is kind of the law of the Christian life. Right, what does he say in verse 21? I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. This is the struggle of the Christian life. That we, we find this struggle going on. Whenever we desire to do right, evil seems to be right there with us. It seems to be a struggle to do what's right. It can be such a struggle to do what's right is that when we stumble and fall into sin, we find ourselves saying what Paul says, I don't understand my own actions. I knew that was wrong. And I went ahead and did it anyway. And I keep finding that the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I really don't want to do, I keep on finding myself doing. Because there is this ongoing war in myself of the things I want to do in my mind and the things I keep finding my self-doing. I seem to lose out to indwelling sin in my members and act against my true self in Christ. And I know that's not really me anymore, Paul says. That's not me, that's sin dwelling in me that's doing that. But it still affects me. Um, when God says, you've burdened me with your sins and you've wearied me with your iniquities, our inner self that belongs to Christ says, I, amen, I know. And it kills me that I don't do better, that I keep doing these things that I don't want to be doing. That is the struggle of the Christian life that Paul expresses here, and it leads him to say what he does at the end of this discussion. Right? He doesn't just say, well, you know, life is tough, get a helmet. It's a struggle. You just have to go out and fight. Where, where does he conclude? He concludes with, I think, a call of a heart that many Christians have found themselves crying out. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Um, the Christian life is a struggle. If we don't understand it properly, as we said last time, if we don't understand how great our misery is, we won't understand how much we need Christ. Right, when Paul says and concludes, wretched man that I am, he's talking about him, himself in his saved state. He's saved, but he's not yet fully sanctified. And as long as he's not fully sanctified, he knows this struggle will be ongoing, and he knows it's a wretched thing to love the Lord in who you are, to love him with your heart, to want to do what's good, and to find yourself continuing to do things that you hate. Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And thankfully, Paul doesn't end with the wretchedness or in hopelessness, but with the hope of God's powerful deliverance. So Romans 7 is the struggle of Christian life. The misery is real, um, but the misery is not the end. It's a wretched thing to carry around an enemy within us, constantly seeking to trip us up. But Paul's hope has to be our hope. That God through Jesus Christ will do what we cannot do. Which is put an end to the struggle. Paul recognizes he can't fight his way out of this. His only hope is to be delivered. To be rescued. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He will do what I can't do for myself. He will bring this struggle to an end. He will rescue me. He will deliver me. He will work so one day so that I am an undivided whole. The wonderful hope that's held out to the Christian is that this wretched divided state is not forever. That God is sanctifying his people. That the Spirit is powerful to do what we cannot do. 
In our own strength, we, just, we seem sometimes to just skirmish against ourselves and not make any progress. But what is the hope that God's word holds out to us? The spirit's desires are against the flesh. The spirit goes to war with the flesh. So in this life, we have to be a praying people for the power and the help of the Holy Spirit to fight against the sin that dwells in our members, for that power that is more powerful than us. But we should not despair in our wretchedness because the Lord will deliver us from this body of death. Um, The struggle of sanctification is real. If it was real for the Apostle Paul, certainly it's real for us. But what he held out before his eyes as his hope is that this struggle would not be forever. There was a day of rescue coming. And so when you as a Christian are borne down by the struggle against your sin, when you are finding those really dark moments of saying, I don't understand what I'm doing. I'm doing what I really don't want to do. What you need to hold before your eyes is the hope of the deliverance that's coming. One of the reasons the Lord Jesus is coming again in glory is to deliver us from this body of death. To deliver us from this struggle. So that we would know a day when we would be an undivided whole. Loving God with our minds and seeing that worked out perfectly in our members. That really is our hope of glory. To be people who perfectly love the Lord. And who live perfectly in accord with with how he's called us to live. A people who are like the Lord Jesus Christ. Who lived a life where his heart, soul, mind, and strength was always perfectly devoted to his father. And who loved his neighbor more than he loved himself. So much so that he was willing to offer himself on the cross as a sacrifice for sinners. That he might save their souls. The struggle is real, but the struggle is not forever. And the Lord is coming soon. And so until he comes, our job is to fight. And not to fight in our own strength, but to fight by the grace and help of the Holy Spirit who will fight for us and with us until Jesus Christ returns in glory to deliver us completely. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God in Jesus Christ, who gives us the victory. Amen. Father in heaven, we do pray that you would work sanctification more and more in our hearts. We recognize this struggle of the Christian life, that we struggle against sin in our members, that we desire to do the things that are pleasing in your sight, but so often we find that we don't carry them out. We pray that we would be aware of the power of indwelling sin that still remains in our members. We pray that that would drive us more and more to call out to you for help, uh, to recognize that we need the grace and the help of the Holy Spirit if we are to go forward in the Christian life. We pray that by his strength, you would help us to never stop striving and never stop praying for his grace and for his help. And when the struggle is overwhelming, when we are racked with guilt over what we've done, when we didn't want to do it, and We know it's not truly who we are, but we find ourselves in the misery of what we've again done, sinning against you. May we turn to your face in repentance. May we recognize that we always have access to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You will always forgive us our sins for his sake. And then we pray that you would help us more and more to cling close to you and to look forward in hope to that day when Christ is coming to save us from this body of death. May we long for that day when we will be wholly devoted to you. And may we live in that hope, recognizing that he is coming quickly. Uh, Fill our minds and hearts with that hope that the time is short for this struggle. Uh, That salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. That the night is far gone and the day is at hand. That this is the last hour. And in that hope would we hold out until the returning of our Lord. Knowing that at his coming we will be delivered from this body of death and that the salvation that has begun in us by the work of the spirit will be brought to completion either when we die and go to be with the Lord or when he comes again in glory but we long for that day help us to fight in the hope of that day we pray for we ask
Let's take up our Psalter hymnals once again, and as a song of response, turn to number 411, Shout for the Blessed Jesus Reigns, and we'll stand together and sing all the verses of number 411. Dearly loved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, lift up your hearts now to the Lord and receive his blessing. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it.